So it looks like we have some people that are starting to come on board. Yay. Welcome everybody. We're gonna get started in just a little bit. We're gonna let some more folks join. Thanks so much for coming today. If you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat. We'll get started in just a little bit. Oh, great. Okay. It looks like we've got a good group here already. Fantastic. Well, we'll go ahead and jump right in. So thanks everybody for coming today. I also want to take a minute before we get started to thank some of our early 2023 sponsors. Events like today, community events really wouldn't be possible without the support of our community members. It's a big heartfelt thank you to all of our um, early sponsors. And so I want to take a minute uh, before we get started just to say thank you. We're so excited to have Alana Rivera from Etta and Billy here today. Alana has been uh, volunteering with us here at WEAVE for probably about, I'm going to say maybe six months or so. And I was actually just looking back on my notes and realized that the first conversation that we had, we talked about holding this workshop. And so I'm really excited to get started and share some of this, um, share some of this information. You know, I think that email marketing is one of these incredibly powerful, but also like incredibly intimidating tools. And uh, we have a lot of hesitation when it comes to, you know, bringing ourselves and putting, inserting ourselves in people's inboxes. And so even when people really want to hear from us, um, it's a hump that we can get over and it's just such a powerful tool to leverage. So Alana is going to be sharing some ways to overcome those beliefs and some strategies to plan your content. And hopefully we're all going to walk away with a whole new perspective when it comes to email. So again, if you have any questions as we're going through the presentation, please just pop them into the chat window. We're going to have some time for Q&A at the end. So please you know, share your questions so we can um, answer them. And then before I hand this over to Alana, I just want to share a little bit on her background. Um, I love her bio. So um, Alana has you know, many years of uh, pushing paper around in the corporate America offices. And then Alana was able to find her passion through a gift from her mom. It was a book on soap making. She founded Etta and Billy, which is a sustainable small batch body care company inspired by a love of food and drink in 2009. Um, and her mission is to bring moments of self-care and indulgence to the everyday lives of busy women. And we'll leave more of that. Etta and Billy has partnered with large retailers like West Elm and Banana Republic, as well as thoughtfully curated small boutiques all across the US, Canada, and Asia. Um, her products have been featured online and in publications like Sunset, In Style, Go Japan, L, Pop Sugar, and Refinery 29. Um, Etta and Billy is a certified green business in California um, and member of the Indie Business Network and the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetics Guild. Um, Alana is also an alumni of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. When not in the soap lab, she's often cooking with family and friends and um, honing her cocktail making skills, as well as chasing her son around the playground. So Alana, we're so excited to have you here today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let you take it from here. Sure. Thank you so much, Allison. I appreciate that. And I'm so excited to share with everybody email. I'm going to sound potentially like a email evangelist. So <laughs> just bear, bear with me, everybody, bear with me. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen right now so we can get started. So give me one second. I am, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sometimes I'll say I'm tech challenged, which is kind of funny when I'm talking about email, but anyhow, so um, one, sorry, one, I just wanna, bring my screen. Let me see if I can bring it. Oh, well, we're gonna. <laughs> Sorry, my screen's being a little funny. I want to do like this. Okay. So first of all, oh, I think as business owners, we all sort of know that email is important. Um, although I will say, I don't think it's quite as like 
sexy as social media. It doesn't get talked about in that same way. Um, however, it is incredibly important. It's one of the best ways to directly connect with your customers on a regular basis, because as we all know, social media algorithms are only able to show like one to 5%. I can't remember what the exact like percentages of our content to our followers. So that's a tiny, tiny, tiny <laughs> number of people, uh, potentially in comparison to how many people we have following us. Whereas with email, you have a much stronger chance of getting right into somebody's inbox and getting your message directly to them. So before we kind of delve a little bit deeper into email, I'd love to have everybody take this quick poll on how often you are currently emailing your newsletter list, if you have one. If you have one, please go ahead and do the poll. I kind of wish I could vote, but I won't. <laughs> But I will tell everybody how many times I do email my list. Hopefully it can help kind of inspire you guys. Results are coming in. I'm just going to go ahead and end the poll. It looks like a lot of folks are um, more than six times a year. Oh, that's good. Uh, oh, great. Okay, great. That is fabulous. So um, just so that I'm also very transparent, I uh, email my list more than once a week. <laughs> most, most times, not all the time, but very, very, very often I'm emailing my list um, more than once a week. And I will share a little bit more about why in a few minutes, but here we go. I am the next kind of thing I wanted to share with everybody is um, stats. I think these are really important. I, um, while I wouldn't call myself a natural numbers girl, I do actually now over the last couple of years, I'm kind of obsessed with these things. So just a few things to kind of get you excited about the pro the prospect of emailing more often. So um, according to a variety of online sources, um, for every dollar you spend on email marketing, you are receiving $36 in return, which is a pretty massive ROI, I would say. Um, and according to some experts, uh, this year alone, almost $11 billion in retail sales is going to come from email. That is just like a mind boggling number to think about. And then um, another stat, one of the stats that I love the most probably is that um, someone who receives an email from you is seven times more likely to purchase from you than someone who just cold comes from anywhere or even social media. I mean, that's like a massive, like another one. And then according to the SBA in a survey they did of small business owners, only, only about 36% of small business owners are not utilizing email. So that's actually not a huge number, but it's still significant enough that there's a space for improvement, I think. And then I took a little survey of a bunch of e-commerce business owners who are friends of mine. So this is a particular to e-commerce for my little unofficial survey. But right now, about 38.5% of our online sales are coming directly from our email list. That is massive. And I actually just went and looked at my stats. And for the last 30 days, 50% of my revenue, my online revenue is coming from email. Huge. So it's just like, it's incredibly powerful um, and it's, it's incredibly helpful too. It's a really great way, like I said, to connect with people, but let's move on. All right. So let's activate the power of email. That is like, why we're all here, right? And so one, we need to email people more often. <laughs> Two, we need to make sure that we're sending content that fits our brand. We need to work on segmenting our audience. And we're going to talk about creating email flows and what that is. And of course, growing the list, which is another very important part of the whole ecosystem of email. So we'll talk about email, emailing people more often. So this is definitely um, something that I find that most 
entrepreneurs, small business owners, creative business owners struggle with um, is emailing people. We are all very afraid of emailing people too often um, and we're freaked out that they are going to unsubscribe. So the first thing, of course, to think about is that they signed up to receive emails from you for a reason. It is very important um, to keep that in your head. And the next thing I like to kind of share is like, think about how many emails you get in your inbox from a retail business or even a nonprofit business. Um, I would say that for most retail businesses, like large retailers, you're getting one to two emails a day <laughs> from those retailers. And then think about how often do you actually unsubscribe from those? And I would say probably not that often. Most of the time, if, if someone's emailing us from like a, a retail location or wherever, and we're not interested in what it is they're offering, we just delete it. Um, very few times do we actually unsubscribe. And if you unsubscribe, you unsubscribe. Like it happens, it's not a big deal. But think, just think about that. I tried to keep that also in my mind because what I used to do is I used to email my newsletter list if I was being good, once a month, I would email people once a month and I was, and I was like, that's great. And it, it took a lot of effort for me to email <laughs> those people once a month. But once I started like adjusting my mindset and thinking about the way that bigger businesses think about it now, granted, obviously our audiences are likely smaller. We may have a more personal connection with our audiences. So emailing people once a day is probably a little too much, but emailing people more than once a month at minimum seems about right. Like people are not, it, it, people are gonna unsubscribe. That's gonna potentially happen, but it's more important that you're actually connecting with people at the time that they're ready to hear your message. And if you're not emailing people at least once a month, you easily could miss them when they're ready to hear your message. So that's why I now email people one to two times a week, <laughs> every single week. So the first thing to think about sort of when we're thinking about how often to email people is obviously the frequency. Like what, what is too often? What is not enough? And again, I, I've mentioned this multiple times. I think that at a minimum, once a month is where it's at. Um, again, I worked my way up from once a month to once a week. And sometimes again, like I said, twice a week, it sort of just depends on what's happening um, within my business. But it is absolutely doable. Um, and we're going to talk about, I think, what is the usually the next like roadblock for people um, when it comes to emailing even once a month, which is content, but we'll get there in a second. So the next thing to think about when you're thinking about the frequency of, of when you send emails is checking stats. Like, how is that? How This is how you know, basically, is if what you're deciding to do is the right thing for your audience and if you need to increase it or if you need to back it off a little bit. So let's talk about some email stats that are really important to pay attention to. So the click rate. So before we get into all of this, I think what you'll see here and in the next slide is the one thing I don't talk about is open rate. I don't pay much attention to open rate anymore. And the reason that I don't pay as much attention to it as I used to is with um, Apple iOS changes around privacy, you can't actually always trust the open rate stats that you see in your email provider. Sometimes they can be off because of the way that Apple now handles privacy. So as long as you're over a certain, let's say 30%, 40%, you're golden. But after that, I just stopped paying attention to it. So these are the, these stats, this next kind of four stats I'm gonna share, those are the ones I pay a lot of attention to. These ones mean something to me. So the first one is click rate. So that's the percentage of people that you emailed that actually clicked on something within your email. And I think it's a really good measure of the health of your email list and the content that you're sharing, right? Because if people are clicking on whatever it is that you are talking about in the email, whether it's an image, it's a button, it's whatever it is, social media links, you know that what you are providing is actually of value to that audience. So it's a really good number to pay attention to. I added this little stat also that I found. So for retail businesses, having a click rate of literally just under 1% is actually really good. So that's another thing to think about is like, 
expectations around what is an appropriate click rate. And so um, whatever email provider you use, make sure that they have benchmarks based in your industry. If they don't, you can find that online, of course, by Googling it, but it is very nice to be able to actually have those benchmarks within your email provider platform so that you can see how you're doing against what the av industry average is. And then obviously that gives you really good information about what you need to work on and what you know is fine and maybe you don't need to like give it as much of your attention at the moment. So um, the other stat that I find to be incredibly important, of course, is conversion rate. So that is the percentage of people who completed a des desired action. So that could be actual sales. So it could be the number of people who actually decided to buy something, but it could also be something like the number of people who decided to sign up for something or fill out a form or complete a survey. There's, there's other ways to think about conversion than just dollars. So you have to decide based on whatever message it is that you put out and whatever you're trying to, whatever your goal is from that email, what the conversion rate would look like. All right, so. All right, your overall email ROI. So this of course is important to check every once in a while. The other stats are stats um, I will tell you that I look at because I'm emailing people every week. <laughs> I am looking at those stats every single week. But overall email ROI is something I don't often pay attention to, um, admittedly, other than somewhere between, I don't know, three, four times a year. But it is, of course, really important. And what that is, is how much return are you getting on your marketing, email marketing spend? So if you're like, did this nice little formula here, if you are spending $125 a month for your marketing fee, for your email provider, how many dollars are you getting back for that spend? So of course, that's a really good number to know because that may mean that you need to make some adjustments if it starts to dip or if it starts to go up, you can pay attention. What did I do differently this month? Of course, the other thing to think about is businesses obviously, depending on the business, have seasonal sale highs and lows. So retail often has a real dip in the summer and a real high in the winter for holiday season. So that's another reason um, to kind of be mindful about looking at some of these numbers is to also realize they are going to be affected by seasonal shifts in spending, natural seasonal shifts in spending. And then another number that I admit I don't pay as much attention to as I really should, and I'm working on it, is list growth. So that's the number of people that you're adding to your newsletter list every single month. Um, I'm going to share a more exact stat later in the presentation, but obviously every time um, you send out an email, you're likely to lose a few people. That's totally fine. It's completely natural. That's just the way it goes. But you need to be, make sure that you are adding more people than you are losing. <laughs> so you want to know how many people am I adding per month? And then obviously give yourself a goal because there's no way to reach your goal. You don't, you don't have, if you don't have a goalpost to shoot for, you have no idea how you're doing, how to gauge what your efforts are actually doing for you. So you, it could be something small, like 20 people a month, five people a month. It depends obviously on your business. It could be a hundred a month, 500 a month, a thousand a month. It's, it ranges. It's really all about what is important for your business and the rate of obviously the number of people that you're losing off your list potentially every month. Okay, now we're going to talk about content. So I had mentioned this before, is that I think there's the concern a, a lot of people have about off how the frequency of emailing people. And I think the other roadblock often for people is, I don't know what the heck to write about, or I'm not really sure. I don't have anything to say there. You could just, the list can go on. I know because I have had these same conversations in my mind <laughs> when I've tried to email, especially when I was doing once a month, because I was like, because it was only one time a month, I often, I think in my mindset was that it needed to be this sort of like long, <laughs> like mini letter to my audience. And the reality is, is, is that is absolutely not necessary. Sometimes I still send emails like that, but I very infrequently for most people, it needs to be pretty small, concise, 
just attention spans are what they are. They're pretty short. So um, how do we figure out how to what to write about? So I think the biggest thing is thinking about our content in what are called content buckets. So it's just a way to categorize the information that we might provide that is of value to our audience. So another good thing to keep in mind is when you are writing emails, when you're coming up with content, whatever it is, you want to think about like, I'm trying to provide a service of information to people 80% of the time and focused a little bit more on sales about 20% of the time. And obviously those might shift a little bit again with like seasonality, but it's something good to keep in mind is like, you want to be of service to the people on your list. Um, they're, they're here again, like I said before, for a reason. So you want to give them a good reason to stay. So let's talk a little bit more about content bucket. So I have a big list of, con or it's not that big, but I have a list of content buckets here. So Things like entertainment, education, conversational, promotional, product, personal, and inspiration. So when you're thinking about what content buckets might fit for your business and then what content you could write underneath that, um, you want to think about who, what audience are you serving? Who are those people? What are they interested in? What are your core values as a business and what makes you different? than your competitor or someone else in your industry. So for example, for entertainment, if you are, um, maybe you're like a plushie business, right? You, you develop these cute little plushies based on food, for example. So your audience is probably someone who's a little fun loving. They might skew a little bit younger. So an entertainment thing you could always do is like, a weekly roundup of your favorite memes, or maybe just a monthly, like I found these really funny memes. I thought you guys would like them. Purely entertainment value. You could do that literally with anything. Um, for inspiration, you could share how you create the thing you do. Or if you're an interior designer, maybe there's a specific color or an image that's recently really inspired a design that you helped someone create. You could share that and share that process. Like, there's all different ways to utilize content buckets to create content that gently reminds people, of course, what you offer and why they're here, um, but also shares a lot with them about what it ma what makes you special and why they should stay connected to you. Um, and then, of course, like promotional is very easy. You're like, I'm having a sale. So, like for example, um, in at Etta and Billy we recently did our customer appreciation week. So that section of emails that I sent were all about why we were thankful for people for supporting us and then gifting them a $10 gift card that they could spend on our site. And so I sent three emails <laughs> that week to just to remind people. So this is a nice sort of like framework to think about creating content that I think for me is really helpful so that I don't feel bogged down with the what to write about. Because that is oftentimes what can block us from moving forward. I will also say, not that I have gotten deep into it quite yet, but of course there is AI to help you now and you can utilize some chat GPT and other um, platforms. I know some people who use Jasper. Um, and those are, I personally, what I like about them from what I've used is they're a great starting point because for me, oftentimes what's the hardest part is actually sitting down and getting started writing. If I have an idea and I could pop it into those platforms and they can get me something that can get me started, that's usually enough. Um, another thing to sort of think about when you're writing these things, I, I mentioned this before, but short form, I think, is really best in, in email. If you want something longer form, what's amazing about this is you could take one of these content pieces that you've created, turn it into a blog post, and link your email out to the blog post. And that way you have people coming back to your site, which is great. Um, but you can also, if someone's really interested and wants the full picture, they can go check it out there. Um, Content buckets are also really helpful even when you're thinking about doing other pieces of marketing for social media, um, whether it's Facebook or Pinterest or TikTok or whatever is sort of your social media platform of choice. All right, so we're going to move on. Segmenting. 
we're going to talk about segment. Oh, before we move on, um, there was a worksheet that you had put together oh, yes. on content plans. I'm just going to pop Thank that you. into the window. It's a really great resource. Um, maybe can you introduce the those ideas and how people can use that worksheet? Absolutely. So um, I developed this. It's just a very easy, simple worksheet where you can write down sort of uh, the mission and core of your business, what your business is. You essentially get to choose five of those content buckets and then take maybe 10 to 15 minutes once you've chosen your content buckets to write out five ideas of content that fits into each content bucket. And what I like about that is once you've done that, you now have 25 email or social media or whatever ideas that you can use. And that is, I think, such a powerful moment in realizing like how easy it is to actually have things to talk about that you can share with your audience that is of value to them and is important to them. So we'll make sure that you guys have that link. You can get that worksheet. Um, and if you need like, I don't remember what those content um, buckets are, you can Google that and people will give you like a list. Um, I'm not sure if we're able to give access to the um, presentation, but if so, you can also get it there. But you can Google it, they come up everywhere. So let's talk about segmenting. So I love segmenting. <laughs> what is segmenting though? Segmenting is basically creating a subgroup of your subscribers and email based on any parameters that you want. So it could be around purchasing a specific product type. It could be the number of purchases they've made. It could be where they are located. It could be like, where they found you, if you have that kind of information. It could be about birthdays. It could be about so many different things. It's pretty incredible. And why, why should you even care about segmenting at all? Um, segmenting is really important because it helps you create a space where you can really um, uh, specify your message to a certain group of people. And it makes people feel really good to know that you're speaking to, you know, this information about them, you're speaking to them in a way that is relevant to them. So for example, if our shipping dates for Etta and Billy for winter are different for the East coast last holiday, you know, shipping, shipping deadline for the East coast and the West coast, it doesn't do my East coast people any good to receive a notification of the last ship date for orders that are on the West Coast, right? Because if all of their friends and family are essentially on the East Coast, they need to know those dates. So you can think, kind of think about it that way. It's, it's a helpful way to guide your messaging for particular audiences. Um, and it can help with open and click rates. And I'll, I'm gonna share a little segment with you guys um, shortly that I created that's hyper, hyper specific and it's, massively helpful for open and click rates. And those are important because your open and click rates and affect a little bit the deliverability of your email. So, and then what can you do for your own business? Like, I mean, you can do basic segments. One of the first segments I ever created was just an engaged audience segment. I'm gonna share what that looks like for me for the back end of my email platform, but that's just people that, seem to be really interested in what I'm offering based on how often they open and click on emails. So, and then you can have unengaged, which is the opposite of that. <laughs> how infrequently someone is opening or clicking on your emails. So here we go. I'm gonna share a couple of segments with you guys. So, um, good segmenting is, oh, sorry. This is actually talking a little bit. Sorry, I forgot. We did a little slide here on, on what are some things that we can base our segments on. And all segmenting, I think, is based on things that we can measure. So you could be measuring things like purchases, most popular products or services, the customer return rate, how that person signed up for you. Was it in-person event or was it online? Um, their location, their gender, and social med media activity. Um, and then if you're not, so those are things that most people have categorized somewhere within their data, their customer data, whether it's on your um, online platform or email platform or wherever you might have some sort of CRM that's tracking that. You can also think about how do I extrapolate this for the future? What do I think about is, is some amazing ways 
that I can start segmenting based on maybe things I'm not measuring now, but could measure in the future. So it could be things like color preference. It could be time on site, which you kind of are measuring, but maybe you could take a more active um, view of that and actually write it down. Frequency and recency, meaning how often is somebody um, going onto your site and within what period of time are they doing that? The open rate and the click rate. So those are some things maybe you're not measuring now, but you could be measuring in the future. So now I'm going to actually share some of my segments. So this first segment in the, uh, the upper, the day one engaged 120 days. So that's my engaged segment. So I have that defined as this person has opened or clicked on an email at least once in the last 120 days. They've been or they've been active on my website at least once in the last 30 days, or they've subscribed to my list at least once in the last seven days. They are not suppressed for email. And then I have a separate segment, segmented list of people that are my wholesale customers. So they're so that this message isn't going to the wholesale customers. That's one, that's one of the general segments. So that day one for me, when I told you I email people every week. That's the first day, all of the people that come up on that segment, um, which automatically populates based on this information. Once I've set it up, I don't have to do anything with it. Um, that's, those are the people that receive this email the first day I send an email out in a week. Um, and then another segment might be uh, that I send often is what I call my day two or day three segment. And that's all the people that didn't open the email from that first segment. And then they get another version of the newsletter slightly twisted that maybe they now will open. Maybe now's an okay time for them to receive that message. And then a very hyper-specific segment that I created is the Orchata Soap Lovers Haven't Purchased in a While segment. And so I did that specifically with these parameters about someone who's seems very interested in the product or has purchased the product before because that's one of our limited edition scents and we were starting to run out of it and I wanted to make sure that people I knew who were interested in it or had purchased it in the past were able to get as many bars as they as they possibly wanted to sort of stock up before it wasn't going to be offered because we only offer it once a year so you have to get it or you don't get it that's just how it goes and people really appreciate when you're paying that kind of attention to them. Um, so this is kind of a nice way to think about how you might be able to segment or hyper segment the audiences you already have. Okay, we're gonna talk about flows. This is one of my other favorite things. Um, what are flows? Flows are a way to automate your emails so that they're sent out based on some sort of trigger. So it could be that whenever someone signs up for your newsletter list, an email flow starts to welcome them and maybe share a little bit more about you and what you do and why they should even care about being there. Um, it could be a flow based on um, a purchase. So maybe they purchased one product and you know that product runs out at a certain amount of time and then they get a reminder flow after a certain number of days that maybe it's time to reorder or get another or like for Etta and Billy, we have a refill option that's twice the size of the regular standard. So we send the refill, letting them know that you might be out, now you have a refill. So why are they important? One, they remind your customers that you're here and it helps get your customers back onto your site, which basically is more chance of them purchasing or taking some sort of action, whatever action that is for you. Also, they're on autopilot. So that means all the work is essentially in the front end of setting them up. Um, you will, of course, need to check them every once in a while to make sure that they're working the way they need to. But essentially, that's it. You kind of set it and semi-forget it. I'll call it semi-forget it. Um, and that's amazing. So things could be like examples. It could be abandoned cart. You could have a, If you're an e-commerce business, you could have a restock. You could have a welcome flow. We talked about that a little bit already. It could be the you bought this, now buy this kind of flow. So we're going to do a, a little overview of a few different types of flows and ideas. Hopefully that will get your like 
creative brain thinking about ways you can utilize flows in your own business. So here are some examples. So an abandoned cart flow. So that means someone started a checkout, they never placed an order. So now they're going to get an email after four hours, and then they're going to get another email after 20 hours, 20 hours later. So this is also, I love thinking about this in, in terms of what other businesses are doing. So pardon me, you can pay, start paying attention when you're shopping online or doing something. What automate, what seemingly automated emails are you receiving from other companies? What do those look like? What's the messaging behind them? How are they capturing your attention? You can use all that information to inform your own process wherever a flow might be relevant. Um, another example is you can start classifying your contents, your, sorry, your contacts based on, on their intent. Like you can use flows depending on your email platform to do all sorts of it, like basically sort of like filtering people into special places for you so that you don't necessarily have to do that manually. Okay. Now we're going to talk about this other, the other part, right? We've talked about how often to send emails, what you should talk about in those emails, how you might be able to segment the emails to sort of personalize your emails a little bit more, how to create flows to automate some of your emails. So your things are just firing in the background that make people kind of reminds people about you and what you're here for and why they might be interested in what you have. Um, and now, of course, we have to talk about growing your list. So I had talked a little bit about this before is, right, we lose people off of our list. The average is somewhere between 25 and 30% for almost all businesses. You lose that many people off your list in a year. That is important to pay attention to because obviously the new people that are on your list are new customers. And if you're losing a lot of people and not filling your funnel back up with new people, that means your sales are gonna start to drop. So the more, the other way to sort of think about this is the more people that you have on your list means that you can have a bigger impact in your community, right? So whatever it is that you do that you share with people, um, the more people you have on that list means the more people you can share that with and hopefully improve their lives in some way, whatever that is. Um, and one of my favorite little things about email lists is they're an intangible business asset. So those email lists are worth money. If at any point in time, part of your exit strategy is to sell your business, the email list is a part of the package of your business that you can show a potential buyer this is worth X number of dollars because you can actually quantify that depending on your email platform. But still, email lists are worth money for all of those stats that I, I kind of shared with you before. You can see. So how are we going to get people on our list? Like, right, what are we going to do? What's the next? So ways to grow your list. If you have a website, you could have a pop-up or a fly-out. There's lots of different ways to talk about the thing that pops up on. We've all seen them. We've all signed up for them, obviously. Um, a link in bio for any of your social media channels. You want to make sure that you have a place in an area where people can sign up for your newsletter list. And every once in a while on your social channels, you can ask people to sign up for your newsletter list. You can have a QR code sign up That's or a paper sign up. So, I, for years, had just a paper, just a notebook at events where people could sign up for my newsletter list. Of course, now with QR codes, you can make that a little easier and a little more automated because people do not always have the best handwriting. And I definitely lost a few email, emails that could have been on my list based on the fact that I could not read someone's handwriting. Um, you could host a giveaway with a fellow business, and that's a way that you could grow your email list together. You can create an email-only access page, and I'll show you an example of that, but those are a nice way to, and again, I feel like many of us have probably run up against these when we've been online and trying to find something, and you get to a page where you're like, I really want this information. The only way to get this information is for me to put my email address in there. And you can always ask your existing customers to share your email. So one thing to think about when you are trying to grow your list is, right, I just talked about the fact that emails are worth 
money. They're an intangible business asset. So if you're asking someone for their email address, which is valuable, you need to make sure you're giving them something of value, right? So that could be an offer. It could be a discount. It could be a download. It could be a lot of things, but you need to make sure that you are offering something in return for that email address so that someone feels like it's worth, it's worth it to give out their email. Cause we, like I said, also before we all receive probably, I don't know, 50 to a hundred emails a day, depending on how many companies you're signed up for. And so we all know there's only so much space and bandwidth in people's inboxes. So we want to make sure that we're, we're giving people something of value. All right. So let's talk about some examples that you might be able to use in your own business um, to grow your email list. So for a, you could actually use the spinner style, I think in a, a sorted businesses, but there's a spinner style pop-up, which essentially gamifies the action of receiving some sort of discount and people cannot help themselves. And that might work for some, you have to always think about like, what, how are my customers potentially going to respond to this? Um, think about that. But people cannot help themselves with these. Like I couldn't, I put my email into this one <laughs> to see. Um, and just so you know, that is an app. So I already know Kaylee Cosmetics is hosted on a Shopify site. That app, and I don't know what that app is called, but you could find it very easily, is um, just an attach, like an app add-on for a Shopify site. And you can, you can wait meaning like you can say like, please only give the 20% discount 5% of the time when people put their email addresses in. You can wait so that it will give a certain discount more often than another discount. So there's a spinner style. You can offer up a free item with the purchase. So this this other pop-up down here with the little little beautiful color chunks, those are Etta and Billy soaps. So this is the offer that we send right now. That's our pop-up offer is People come to our site um, after about 12 seconds. <laughs> this pop-up comes up and asks people, do you want a free soap sampler gift set? You do have to purchase one other item to receive it, but you're getting an $8 value. Plus now you get to smell all these different scents for free, um, just popping your email address in. So you can think about maybe a free item might be, and it could be a digital download, it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical item. Um, someone who's like a surface designer, maybe you offer like a downloadable wallpaper for your phone or the background of your computer. Like there's lots of ways to do this where you don't have to necessarily give a discount um, or give a physical item. So we're gonna share some of these. So some alternatives, like I was talking about that gated page where someone has to put in their email address to see what's what's really there. So my friend Danny with her jewelry, she has a gated sales page. So she has all these beautiful kind of organic stone rings and jewelry pieces. And she has a sales page. And if people want to have access to that special insiders only sales page, they need to put in their email address. And once they do, that pop-up dissolves and now people have access to shop in that special area. But you could even have that as like, um, maybe it's access to an informational video. Maybe it's access to some recipe cards or different recipes or access to, I mean, the sky's the limit. It sort of a, depends on your own business, but you can make it so that people have to take an action before they receive the thing that you're trying to get them. Um, another option is a quiz. You can set up a quiz. So my friends at One Kid have their road coat quiz. So it basically, again, is another, people love quizzes. For anyone who used to read like teen magazines, you know, like you can't help yourself, even though you know they're kind of silly, like you still have to do the quiz. And so this is a great way that they've sort of gamified the action of getting that email because people want to know like, what is how much do I know about this? And they're willing to go ahead and take the quiz. Okay, guides, tips, anything like this. This is a great example from a, a Weave member of drop your name and your email into here and you can get these 21 tips to help you. So again, you're providing something of value to people so that they're, they feel like what they're giving you is worth what they're getting. Okay. Woo, all right. 
No, we did it, everybody. So now we can go through some questions if everybody, anybody has questions. And thank you so much for, for being here and listening to my email evangelizing. That was fantastic. <laughs> I converted. Yay! Uh, <laughs> Um, the slide just before that was one of our clients, Lisa Braithwaite. I love that idea of having a downloadable piece and I love your example of a wallpaper or something that isn't necessarily your core product, but still has a lot of value to your customers. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have a handful of questions in the okay. chat right now. Um, Great. And uh, we also, we have a little bit of time too. So if anyone wants to add some questions in there, even something as specific as, you know, what do you think about this idea for your buckets? You know, we have a oh, little yeah. bit of time that we can, um, you know, really provide that feedback. But, um, you know, I think that's such a great place to start and like look at your content buckets and what some of those ideas might be and flesh them out and really kind of like sort of, um, you know, start on that, that high level piece and you can dig in as much as you want. But this is a great space to, to share some of those ideas. Um, so one of the first questions that came in, we have um, a, what was a comment somebody was talking about a, they have an abandoned cart email that offers 10% off if they finalize their purchase, like once mm -hmm. a customer, and that is something that's generated a few sales. And if you had any, you know, specific thoughts about, um, about that and, and um, yeah. Sure. I, I mean, here's the thing is one of my mentors has said this to me probably like a million times now is test and learn. So if you have an idea and it's working for you, but you want to see if something else might work for you, go ahead and test it. What if you tested not offering 10% off? So I'll tell you something. I don't ever offer people a discount on an abandoned cart and people still convert. I just remind them three times instead of one time or two times. So maybe that's what it is. You can test like, what if I send two or three emails instead of one or two emails? What, what changes? And then see, you can, you can, then you can compare one thing to the other thing and see which one worked out the best. And then you can keep iterating and iterating and iterating. And maybe it's, you test the language in your email. Maybe it's, you test with, um, different styles of links. Maybe it's different imagery. Like maybe it's with a, um, one thing I've found that works for me is a customer testimonial. So I don't have, like I said, I don't put an offer in for my abandoned cart, but I do put in like a testimonial, a pretty generalized testimonial about why Ed and Billy is great. Like maybe you could try that. There's lots of different ways to test, but it, like I said, if 10% is working for you, awesome. But if you want to test maybe not offering, do it and see what happens. And you can always go back. I mean, that's the beauty of owning our own businesses, right? Is we're in charge. We get to decide and you get to change your mind and do something different if you want to. So that's fantastic. I feel like there's such a good, like overarching message that it is, it's going to go in the end, but like it feels so heavy when at the end of the day, it's a really just space to try things. You know, when you send one email, um, that is, it's a data point. It's something that they might read, they might not read. And we don't have to put so much, um, we don't have to put so much weight into the messaging of it. And it, it's a space to try things and see what resonates. That's Absolutely, great. absolutely. And it's a, it is a really, like you will learn so much. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can learn so much. And, and another thing I like to sort of remind people is that as, entrepreneurs as small business owners, a lot of times our heart, soul, emotion is very tied up into what we do. And that can sometimes make it really hard to make strategic business decisions because it's so personal to us. But when you focus on these data points, you can kind of remove the emotion out of it. You can go, okay, well, that email did better than this email. Why? Was it the subject line? Was it the picture? What was it? And then you can try and do another version of it and see if you can pinpoint what, what thing was it instead of going, oh my gosh, no one likes what I'm writing about because that's, that's not helpful. But like these data points, these are helpful. You can take an action based on data, right? You can, you can make a decision based on data. Yeah. It's very freeing numbers. I love them. <laughs> Perfect transition. So the next yeah. three questions on here, I think that you have another slide after this one that talks about oh, resources. I do. I do. Thank you. I will you, flip to this. So we I have will, 
Yeah, we have some folks that are talking about like mail systems. Um, uh, some people are on Mailchimp currently. Yes. And um, and and one thing that I know that isn't on here, and you mentioned QR code generators. Yes. If you have some resources, actually, the Canva does do that. Yes, I was um, going to say. It's, yeah. Canva's my jam for so many things. So here, I'll just go over some of these resources really quickly. So for email providers, I personally use Klaviyo. I love Klaviyo. I will say this about Klaviyo, it is powerful, it is wild, it is amazing, it integrates with lots of stuff. It is not always the most intuitive system. So I have built a lot of things on my own within Klaviyo. They do have a strong resource guide and are very helpful, but I have also paid people to help me build things in Klaviyo because it can be confusing. Um, I have also used MailChimp. I think MailChimp is also wonderful. I think MailChimp has beautiful templated designs. I think that is like a really great part about MailChimp. Um, and I believe they give you the same sort of stat level that Klaviyo does. Of course, there's also constant contact. And then Allison told me about Entreport, which I had no idea about. Entreport. But that seems like, yes. And that seems like a really great option for maybe more service-based businesses to utilize because each one of them sort of has their their space that they're really 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 good in whether it's like an actual retail space or a service space so you can check out those if you want a deeper dive into information around email you can think hubspot is great although i will say this about almost all of these get ready to like rabbit hole just <laughs> <laughs> you're like one article to the next article to the next thing so just keep that in mind when you go to some of these so the hubspot has a ton of information so does the clavio blog the campaign monitor also anything um basically marketing related campaign monitor is wonderful and then entreport has a university so they have training on all sorts of different topics and then for design inspiration and of course the qr codes canva i love canva um, can, what can I say? I am not a designer. That is not my skill set. Canva has made it so that I can do a lot of things on my own without having to pay a designer and have them actually look nice and professional and wonderful. And I, if you do not pay for the full version, I recommend considering paying for the full version of Canva. Um, just the templates and access it gives you and imagery is pretty wonderful. Um, there is a uh, website called Really Good Emails, and all it is is a um, is a space where a, there's all these beautiful examples of emails categorized, whether it's by like offering or um, message or by like time of year, and it's a really great place to find inspiration. I love really good emails. They also have a pretty solid newsletter <laughs> that you can sign up for, pardon me, where they go over different concepts, and then they share out different articles that they've come across recently that are really helpful. And the other thing they do really nicely in that email is they highlight one sort of design element in email that's really hot right now and then gives you examples of it. It's really nice. It really gets like the creative ideas flowing, I like. And then, of course, colleagues, your business colleagues. You can sign up for other people's email just to get information and inspiration and your competitors. What are your competitors talking about? That's also good because oftentimes, um, I think we kind of get too stuck in our heads again about like, oh, look what they're doing blah, blah, blah. But it's nice to actually have a real data point and that's looking at emails and then you know, like, well, I can do that, but I can't do that. But that's okay because my audience loves me for this reason. So I'm going to really push the gas on that reason, the reason people come back to me. So hopefully that was helpful. That's fantastic. Super helpful. Um, so I want to make sure that we have a little bit of time left over, but one of the questions that was also in the chat I think it's important to just touch on for maybe just like two minutes, which is email cleanup. I mean, you know, oh. we're talking about, and this is not a two minute answer, um, but you know, how often do you clean your list? And um, can you just kind of like touch on what that process looks like for you? Sure, that's a great question. And thank you so much um, for bringing that up. So I try and clean my list twice a year. 
And I do that in roughly in January and I do it in August. And I have reasons for that. And that is after the holiday rush of people, I want to make sure because for me as a retail business, uh, most of my customers are buying or taking an action in those months. So cleaning my list in January is great because it gets rid of any of the dead weight. Because I will say, of course, not only is cleaning your list important so that you're not paying for people who aren't really interested necessarily in what you're offering anymore, but it also helps with deliverability. So you don't have these people that are dragging down your deliverability. Um, and then I do it again in August. And I do it in August because right before we start to ramp up in our list building activities before the holidays, I want to start to say goodbye to all the people again, who haven't really been engaging or taking an action. And I, the way that I do it in, in Clavio is that I create a segment of people and I call it my to suppress segment. And in it, I basically do parameters. Like I think my, I have mine set right now to has not opened or clicked on an email in like 250 days and then has not maybe like made a purchase and I might do a slightly smaller amount of time or a slightly bigger amount of time. It sort of depends. And then of course, whoever's not suppressed already and whoever's not on my wholesale list. And then through the power and magic of the online data processing, it spits out a list of people and sometimes it's frightening. <laughs> like the last time I think I had to clean 1200 people off my list doesn't always feel very good but at the end of the day it's really important and then essentially you can export that list and then import it to your suppressed list so it will automatically take those people and and stop sending them emails now as long as you have your that those segments set to not sent to suppressed, but those are all suppressed people now. And now you're not paying for those people. And now you don't have to worry about those people sort of dragging down some of your stats and your deliverability. That's huge. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. No problem. Um, for anyone that the, the de deliverability piece of it, um, you know, we want to make sure that the emails end up in people's inboxes and not in their spam folders. Yes. And one of the things that people look for is whether or not you have engaging emails. And so um, email providers, no matter who it is, are able to see, is this something that like, do people want to hear from the sender? So it's really, really important. Such a good question. Yeah, it really is. Alana, thank you so much for this incredible presentation. There was so much information in here. Incredibly, incredibly valuable. Um, I think that we're all going to have to sort of like sit with some of this information and uh, take some time to, to process. Um, I do want to share that we do have other resources available here at Weave. Let me just do a little share screen yeah. real quick. And, you know, um, Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. I was like, I should make sure. And, you know, before I actually move into this, you know, how can people get in touch with you and find your products? would be a, a great follow-up as well. Wonderful question. So you can always find us online. We're on almost all the social media platforms, Etta and A-N-D, all spelled out, Billy. We're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I'm not on Twitter, um, <laughs> Pinterest. Um, and then of course you can go to edaandbilly.com. You can shop, you can check out things, you can go lurk on the blog, you can learn stuff um, and you can always contact me through any of those platforms. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alana. Yeah, no problem. Um, some other things that we have coming up here at Weave, we do have our community events that are always happening. Um, one of my favorite ones is our Strong Miss Strong Coffee. If you haven't attended previously, this is an opportunity just to grab a cup of coffee. It's every third Friday of the month. So it's um, an ongoing uh, connection piece. And we're always highlighting members of the community. We have clients, people have gone through our programs, supporters. Um, and so if you haven't joined us in the past, we do have a new link to register. So you would just go to um, the link here on the screen. You can also find that on our events page. Next month, we have Patty Cortez Washington joining us. We're really excited about that conversation. 
Uh, we also have two uh, financial webinars that are going to be coming up uh, in May and June. Uh, the first one's available in English and in Spanish, and it's Know Your Worth Negotiations. Again, this is another, you know, we volunteer just like Alana, people who are interested in giving back to the community and somebody who can take your specific concerns if you're looking to learn how to negotiate with your vendors or um, anything in, in your business or even personal life. This is a really great place to find some of those tips. Uh, we also have um, a Spanish language workshop on June 14th, which is all about being better equipped to handle your finances. Uh, we also have uh, Cafe Conexito, which is our Spanish language networking group. It's going to be in person May 24th, all in Spanish with um, Juliana Ramirez with JR Bookkeeping. You can always find our events going on at uh, Weave Online backslash events. And we do also have two courses that we're currently enrolling for right now. We have an in-person financial empowerment class taking place on May 6th. This is going to be at VCCF, which is our new offices in Ventura County in Camarillo. We're so excited about this new space. It is a free or um, offering that is just meant to increase your financial uh, confidence and being able to take charge of, of your you know, finances. We're also enrolling for our um, Canvas. It's a one-page business planning course. This is a really great space of, of starting off with a business plan that is on a single piece of paper where you can really understand your you know, KPIs, what you need to move forward. Um, and that is um, something that you can learn more about at weaveonline.org backslash business classes. Um, and then your feedback is so incredibly important. If you haven't taken this survey previously, you can QR code, use your phone. You can take it from your phone um, and let us know what do you want to learn about? Do you want to hear more about email marketing? Do you want to hear more about you know, finances? There's so many different um, educational opportunities when it comes to small business development. And so your opinion is incredibly valuable. Um, so you can just use this QR code here or go to that link to let us know what you want to hear more of in the future. And then finally, thank you. We're just a little bit over time here, but you know, um, we'd love for you to stay connected, follow us on social media. Um, and you know, we are so looking forward to the next session. Thank you again, Alana. Um, fabulous session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a fabulous rest of the day. Bye. <laughs> Bye.